Let's flip over to the book of Joel, Old Testament prophet, Joel chapter 2. And we're going to jump right into this word and into the scripture. Joel 2, verses 15 through 17. What do we say if you have it? Somebody say word up. Somebody else want to say something different. Bring the book. To God be the glory. The Bible says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people and sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck their breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Verse 17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. Let us stop right there. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word shall not return unto you void. So we thank you in advance for what it's going to do. Your word was sent to heal us, deliver us, cleanse us, set us free. And we thank you, Lord God, that our hearts are open to what you have to say. Our ears are open we thank you, Lord God, that you would open our eyes to see, Lord God, what you would have for us. God, we want to be all that we can be, but it is for you and to your glory. It is in Jesus' name that the church say, thank God. Amen. One more time, thank God and amen. You may have your seats in the presence of our life-changing king. Church, I'm coming again from the thought of be all that you can be. This is part two. If you're here last week, you know that we started our uh, Descent of the Prayer sermon series with this title, Be All That You Can Be. Uh, you know that this is the old army slogan for over 20 years. I told the Marines, don't worry about it. We already preached a few good men. Air Force, we are not flying off to the wild blue wherever. Anchors away for all of our Navy folks, but we're talking today about being all that we can be. Somebody say, the army. Be all that you can be. That's what we want as saints in church. Let me just tell you this right quick. I do believe this, um, that everybody is placed in the one of four categories. And we are either, hear me, you're either sinking or you are surviving. Or you are settling or you are thriving. You hear me what I'm saying? Everybody, I don't know who I'm talking to, you either sinking or you are surviving you are settling or you are thriving. How many know that God wants you to thrive? Come, who am I talking to in here already today? Who knows that God wants you to thrive? Not just settle, not just survive, but thrive. Let me tell you what I mean by that because I don't want you to take it out of context uh, because it doesn't mean you got a whole bunch of money in the bank and that everything is going well in your life. I mean, everything is peachy and hunky-dory. Uh, thrive means you are able to be the best you can be in the situation you're in. I stopped by to tell you that God can change situations, seasons, and circumstances, but you can change you. So when you thrive, you are saying, you know what, I'm doing the best I can. I'm being the best I can be in the season that I am. Someone give God a praise for that word already. Who's thriving in here? So since I feel this so strong in my spirit as we delve into this fasting, I want you to know that God wants to do something special on today. I could feel it on the prayer call on Friday night. God wants to bless. Somebody say bless me. God wants to heal, deliver, and set free. God wants to prosper. God wants to enhance. God wants to improve. Somebody say that's me. So we are going to submit ourselves this living sacrifice. Somebody say, here am I. For my note takers, go on and jot that down. You can drop it in the chat. Here am I. We're going to come back to this as we close. This is the living sacrifice we submit ourselves unto God. And this is our official closeout of the sermon series on prayer. Remember, it was entitled, It's Time to Pray. And we did this for over two months because the Bible says, Jesus said, men ought to always pray and not faint. That's the mandate. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. God's going to make a way somehow. Men ought to always what? Pray, pray without ceasing. Listen, 
So even though we've learned a lot of things about prayer, we know that prayer is, in, in many cases, the result of frustration. Frustrated about something, so you decide to pray. But I'm telling you that I do believe that this frustration really is what I call divine agitation that gets you to get more communication and connection with God. You all remember that? When you're frustrated about a thing, it could be God giving you some divine, who wants to be agitated all the time? But perhaps it's God giving you some divine agitation so you can have more communication and connection with God. Prayer, most people say it's just talking to God. But I stop by to tell you it's more than just the conversation with him. Somebody say amen. Amen. Prayer is more than just talking to God. Prayer must be strategic. Meaning we've given some careful thought about the opposition and the outcome. Now, I know we're Christians. We're not supposed to be so focused on the devil, the adversary. But the Bible says for us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Satan has a strategy. The Bible says, listen, he comes but not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. The Bible says Satan desires to have you. To sift you as wheat. The Bible says the adversary is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he make. The devil has a strategy. So since we know he has a strategy, then we must be strategic with our prayers. Because if you are just talking to God, you are praying without a strategy and you could be praying amiss. We haven't talked about this in these two months about prayer, but we can't close out without your understanding. If you're just talking, if you're just having a communication with God, if you're just asking for things, James said, be careful. He says, you ask, but you receive not because you pray amiss. James chapter four, verse three, make sure you mark that in your Bibles because he's saying that you shouldn't pray, but he says, be careful. Because you're asking but you're not receiving, it is because you're praying amiss. It says, then you consume it upon your own lust. We taught that lust doesn't have anything to do with sex entirely. It means just what you want. What you want. Meaning we shouldn't pray with the wrong motive. We shouldn't pray selfish prayers or unrighteous prayer, nor should we, watch this, pray a prayer asking God for something to approve that we already know what we're going to do. Am I in the church on today? You know how you already go ahead and commit to do it. Don't ask God to bless it. God said, no, 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 that's your mess. I don't bless your mess. Somebody say hallelujah. Church, did you know that the only prayer, God only answers one prayer. Is it forgiveness? What is the, God only answers one prayer and that is his own. Did you hear what I said? It's only one prayer that God answers and his, it's his own. I told you we must pray the word of God. It gets God's attention. You pray the word of God and the word reveals his will. And when we know his will, it shows us his way. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the truth and the life. Ain't nobody getting to the father except by me. Somebody say strategic. Our prayers must be strategic. And church, I'm just like a fire. I'm I'm a fire fire truck today. I'm moving fast. Because we're trying to get to the point that we learn what we're going to do with all of this weight we got on us. It's time to fast, church. It's time to fast. I'm excited about it. Two sure ways for us to pray strategically. Make sure you catch this. Number one, you pray in the spirit. And number two, you add fasting to your prayer. Those are the two ways to pray strategically. We know the devil is strategic. But if you want to pray strategic prayers, number one, pray in the spirit. And number two, add fasting to prayer. And watch this. They all, they both involve the same thing, denying yourself. When you pray in the spirit, you're basically saying, Holy Spirit, tag you it. You pray. Because the Bible says you don't even know what to pray for. So you get to say, the Holy Spirit says, thank you, I'll take it from here. 
That's when you pray in the spirit. And when you add fasting to praying, you deny yourself and you humble yourself and you pray the word and the will of God. In both cases, it is a humbling experience. And that's how we pray. Now, y'all, am I in church today? Y'all already concerned about what you ain't going to be able to eat. I ain't going to get too excited till I find out what this fast is all about. But that's why we're going to learn about it. Somebody say amen. amen. That is how we pray strategically. When you add prayer and fasting together, you just took prayer to the strategic level of warfare. I know what I'm talking about now. I'm a graduate of the United States Army War College. There's the tactical level of war, there's the operational level of war, and there's the strategic level of war. And in the spirit, I do you know that there's a war in the heavenlies. And in the spirit, when you add prayer and fasting, you just took prayer to the strategic level. You ain't asking about no bills and no toys, no new car. Church, flip with me over to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. Just flip there and you can follow along because all of you know this account. God says in Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I know the plans that I have for you. And then he goes to describe those thoughts and those plans to Jeremiah by using terms like peace, not evil. Not to harm you, prosper you, uh, give you a good future, an expected end. I'm merging the King James Version with the NIV versions because most people are familiar with both of those versions. Jeremiah says, I know what I've been thinking about. That's what God told Jeremiah. I know what I've been thinking about my people. I know the plans that I have. So then Paul comes on the scene in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 9, by saying, I haven't seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of men the things that God hath prepared. So God told Jeremiah, I've been thinking. He told Jeremiah, I've got plans. And Paul comes and says, you ain't seen it yet. You haven't heard about it yet. It hasn't even entered into your heart yet for the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Somebody say, I love him. So then what was Paul talking about? I don't know, but I can tell you if he is talking about what God told Jeremiah, then I want to see it. If Paul is talking about what God told Jeremiah, then I want to have it. If Paul is talking about what God told Jeremiah, I want to feel it. I want to experience it. Who's with me? Are you seeing this? And if you want to see it, hear it, have it, feel it, experience it, you've got to make up in your mind that nothing, no devil in hell, and no one is going to stop you from getting it. What God has for you is not up to the church. Somebody say amen. But if you know the story from Paul in verse 10, he said, now, I hadn't seen it and ear has not heard it and hadn't entered into your heart yet, but God has revealed it. Paul is trying to be tricky here with this language so you understand um, you won't get it this way, you're going to get it that way. What is he saying? He says, um, you're not going to be able to pick it up in the natural senses, the five senses. You're not going to be able to see it with these You're not going to be able to smell it, hear it, taste it, feel it. But then Paul says he has revealed it. Did you know that you have spiritual senses too? Paul is saying now he's hidden it from your natural senses and he's revealed it to your spiritual senses. You you have spiritual senses. The Bible tells us to oh taste and see that the Lord is good. That's a sense. Uh, somebody wrote a song that says, look like I can feel the breaking. Of, that's a sense. You've got spiritual senses. Uh, the Bible says, I think I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Did you know that you had spiritual senses? It's called discernment. That's why we fast and pray, church. We can't be on the fast all the time. It's got to be temporary so that we go through this exercise of removing the clutter. 
Letting go of the baggage and the luggage. Getting, se- getting yourself over the offense. Forgiving the person you should have forgive, get forgiven 18 years ago. Getting over that one comment that was made to you in the morning that ruined your whole day. No, you didn't have a bad day. You had a bad one minute. But you milked it all day long. The fast helps us to put that stuff away. Oh, I had a bad day. No, you just, somebody stole your park at 8.15 and it's 6.15 and you still mad. In our text, the prophet Joel said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Y'all better be glad Elder Merle Trumpet is back in the back. (laughs) Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. He said, gather the people, that's everybody. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. That means even get the babies, get everybody. Listen, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber. Stop the marriage, stop the wedding, and the honeymoon. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. There, here it is, church. Look at your neighbor and say, here it is. is. This is the call for the fast. So here we go. Strap on, we moving fast. Let's afflict our souls. Say amen. amen. Let's get this weight off of us. Somebody say amen. Now, some people weren't here last week, and I need to make sure I'm clear, but the weight that I'm talking about is not seen on the scale. You have some weight that's been weighing you down that has nothing to do with your bodily weight. Amen? Come on, you got issues because your mama didn't love you. You got issues because your daddy didn't affirm you. You got issues because your third grade teacher said something about you. You got issues. And the Bible says we got to set that weight aside because it so easily besets us. Amen. So who's ready to get this weight off of you? Who's ready to get your soul under control? Who's ready to humble yourself and deny yourself? You know, Michelle Obama said when they go low, we go high. But let me tell you this. No, we go low, then God will take us high. You humble yourself and God will exalt you and lift you up. We're going to remove all the blockage and all the distractions so we can see and hear from God. Paul says that God has revealed some things that you can't see. You shouldn't be satisfied. God has said some things that you can't hear. You shouldn't be satisfied. Somebody say, teach us, Lord. Listen, in my estimation, one of the most profound, prolific and charismatic Christian thinkers and communicators is the late Dr. Miles Monroe. And listen to this now, he is quoted as saying, when purpose, say purpose, when purpose is misunderstood, abuse is inevitable. Abuse, what is that word? Abuse is a shorter version of the phrase abnormal use. You take the microphone and try to comb your hair with it. That is an abnormal use of the, of the microphone. In other words, you will always misuse, mismanage, or abuse what you don't understand. That's right. That's right. You with me? Right. Things that you don't understand that you're ignorant of or about, you will abnormally use it or abuse it. So then we must understand the fast. What is the fast? I hope they're going to get it up on the screen. The fast is, listen, the willful, not because I called it, the willful temporary abstaining from natural habits and pleasures for a spiritual purpose and outcome. You see that? The fast, a willful and the most important thing, temporary, abstaining from natural habits and pleasures for a spiritual purpose and outcome. The fast. It is most associated with food, but we will see by way of revelation that the fast includes food, but it goes beyond food. I told you last time, when you pray, you're asking God for more of him. You're asking God for more from him. But when you fast, you give God more of you. 
The whole thing about the fast is about an exchange. I don't want to call for a fast and not explain to you what the fast is all about. It is denying yourself, the flesh, the lust, cutting people off, cutting things off so your spirit can come forth. Don't you want to be all that you can be? Don't you want to be the best that you can be? So the fast is a God mandated exercise and we don't want to misuse. We don't want to abuse the fast because you may lose some bodily weight. But that's not the goal. The fast is not a torture because I'm not eating. It's it's not a miserable experience. It's not just the diet. So if you want to lose some weight, you may lose some weight. That's fine. But like I said, the weight that you're losing won't show up on the scale, but it will show up in your heart. The weight that we're going to lose, it might not show up on the scale, but it will show up in your attitude. It will show up in your reaction and your responses. When somebody does you wrong, you sit there and say, you know what? You used to say, I could, but I won't. Now you say, I don't even want to. The weight that we see, some of y'all don't want to lose the weight because even as a Christian, you say, I wish you would say something to me. No, you don't. We already talked about being Mary's most. I could snatch her. That's immature. But the son say, I don't even want to. I'm mad that I even thought about snatching her. I got to grow. Oh, y'all ain't ready to grow. Y'all ain't ready to grow. I promise you now that we've been in church year after year, month after month, and all we talk about is sin. So since you think that you married and you haven't slept around, you think everything is fine in your life. I don't sin. I mean, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't have sex out of wedlock. I'm not a fornicator. I'm good. You sure are. You are good. But it's got one too many O's. We're looking for people who are godly. Godly. So the weight that we're going to lose is going to show up not on the scale, but it will show up everywhere else in your life. The decisions that you make, the relationships that you have. So church, listen, somebody say time to fast. And there's a lot of information available about the fast. I cannot give it to you all in any one, two, or three sermons. But what I want to give you are what I call two major approaches to the fast that will help us understand it better. Number one, say this with me, separation. Separation. And number two, closing the gap. With all the information available, I do believe I can fit it into these two categories and not keep us here until football Sunday. Here's the revelation. Don't miss this now. The Bible says, you know this verse, we are in the world, but we are not of it. Somebody say amen. Amen. I can tell if you understand it by the amens. We are in the world, but if we are saved, we are not of it. Our grandparents used to always say, this world is not my home. I'm just traveling through this place. I'm in the world, in the flesh, but I'm not of it, of the spirit. So here's what we must do. Here's the revelation. Don't miss this point. We must separate ourselves from the world that we are in so that we can close the gap in the world that we are of. Ooh, I don't want nobody to be confused. We're in the world. Say amen. amen. But we are not of it. We are of another world. So the fast helps us, watch this now, separate ourselves from the world that we are in. See, the church to gets it out of context. All they say is, come up from among them. Come up from among them. Who? Your husband? What if you saved and your husband not saved? What, what if you saved and your sister, brother, or cousin is not saved? That's not what we're saying. Separate yourself from the world that you're in. Be sanctified for God's use so that you can close the gap with the world that you are of. God, our Father, is in charge of the world that we are of, and we want to close the gap with him. The Bible says Satan is the prince. Listen, he is in charge of the world that you're in. So we separate ourselves from that world, so we close the gap with God. And Come on, somebody give God a shout of praise if you understand the revelation. 
We got to learn so that we don't abuse the fast. Let's look at separation first because sometimes you won't hear from God until you can't hear from anybody else. Minister Jessica prayed on the prayer call Friday night and she said something, I'm paraphrasing, uh, God, I close every access the devil has to me. Close the door. So God sometimes can't say anything to you because he can't get to you until you can't hear from anybody else. So being separated or isolated is sometimes God's will. John was on the Isle of Patmos and you know that he heard directly from God. So much so that people started calling him John the Revelator. John ain't got no revelation. It's the revelation of the Lord Jesus. Revealed unto John. Don't get it twisted. You be thinking that I got a revelation. John got a revelation. Paul, Apollos, the revelation is of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he was on that Isle of Patmos, he was separated, he was isolated. God was able to get to him so that other people couldn't dilute what he was hearing. You might not know this, but when you got saved, you gave God your heart. Say, I gave God my heart. But did you know he wants your ear too? I got saved, I gave God my heart, but he wanted your ear too. There are some people in your life who are speaking so loudly, you can't even hear God. Oh. Some people in your life are speaking, and I'm talking about church people too. They always got a word. Some people are speaking so loudly in your life that you can't hear God. When you got saved, you not only gave God your heart, but you gave him your attention. There's so many things going on in the world today. We've got information at our fingertips. You signed on your computer just to do some work and bam, an advertiser popped up because you were talking about going on a vacation. Now you got 10 choices that you didn't even ask for. So many things going on. So you gave God your heart, but he says, I also want your attention because listen, attention comes with the cost. That's why the adults will tell the kids, pay attention. Attention ain't free. You got to give up something to give attention. You got to look away for some things to pay attention. Somebody say amen. amen. So you've got to give up some things. This is what the fast is all about. You've got to be able to focus on God. Somebody say separation. separation. You know I'm preaching the book today. I'm preaching the book today. Because when Paul, you know who he is, is credited with writing, watch this, 13 epistles. And you know the importance of these letters, and some are called the prison epistles, meaning there is a belief that they were written. Some people say seven. I'm not going to argue with the theologians because it's not germane to the point. Some say it was about six or seven letters that he wrote when he was either under house arrest or in jail. Paul showed us that he can be the best that he can be and experience God's best even when the situation and the circumstance is not what you always want. Somebody say, I'm not satisfied. God might not always change the situation or the season, and he can, but he will allow you to get better to be all you can be. Somebody say, be all that you can be. Now you're ready to thrive because when Paul was alone, he could hear clearly, he could see clearly, and he could receive from God. You know the importance of the apostle Paul. In these letters, we are living these, the Bible says that we are living epistles read of men. And how encouraging it is to us as Christians today because Paul did not fight being isolated. Paul did not fight going to prison, but no, you can't ever be alone. You have what I call FOMO and FOBLO. You scared to say, what's that? FOMO, the fear of missing out. FOBLO, the fear of being left out. You have to be in all things. You have to be all things to all people. Who am I talking to? Do you know anybody like that? You must be in every conversation. We could be in a room that's so large, but if two people over on the side, what y'all talking about over there? 
You have the fear of missing out, the fear of being left out. You can't be separated. You are uncomfortable with being alone. But hear me, I'm going to help you. You're not lonely. You just lack purpose. Because lonely is not the absence of people. Lonely is the absence of purpose. Ooh, it's getting quiet up in here. You need a lot of people around you. You ain't got no purpose. Loneliness is not the absence of people. It's the absence of purpose. And when purpose is known, the people will come. But it'll be the right people. Don't you want people surrounding you because they know you got purpose? Then that means they've been assigned to you. But you want everybody around you. It's almost like you go fishing. You don't want to look for the fish. You want to cast the net. You want everything. The boot, the cans, the cups. The, well, all kind of fish. Stuff that you didn't even want. But you know you got a lot. Somebody say, help us, Lord. When purpose is known, the people will come. And so during the fast, we are going to pray that God reveals purpose. Come on, somebody say, reveal purpose unto me. One more time, reveal purpose unto me. So that's number one. We separate ourselves from the world we're in and we close the gap with the world we are of. Satan's intention, this is number two, has always been to cause a divide between God and man. Always. And he uses the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life to do so. That's all he wants to do is to separate God from man. Well, God's intent is to close that gap. Say, close the gap. And he uses prayer and fasting and denying ourselves. Jesus said, no flesh shall glory in my presence. Don't come to my presence with a bunch of flesh. So God wants us to have that gap closed. Let me tell you how it all happened from the beginning. Satan tricked Adam because of his desire for forbidden fruit. You know the story. And the Bible says God sent them forth from the garden. The Bible says he drove them out, creating this gap between God and man. There were other trees in the garden with fruit. But because you were told, deny yourself, discipline yourself, control your soul, and don't eat this one, you know the rest of this story. Other trees, other trees had fruit. The number one way to close the gap with God is obedience. Minister Shania just got up here and told us that when we take Holy Communion, when we fast, when we pray, this is all about obedience. Adam did not deny himself. He wouldn't deny himself and he was disobedient. I told you last week, sin is not the problem. It's the lust. It's the flesh. And the Bible says the flesh, when it has conceived, it will birth sin. But somebody say that was the first Adam. Come on, look at your neighbor and say that was the first Adam. Satan tried the same trick with the last Adam. Say Jesus. But he got whipped this time. Somebody said he got whooped. Jesus had just finished a fast. Don't miss this now. Jesus was physically weak and hungry, but he was spiritually strong. Did you hear what I just said? He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was weak and weary. He was physically weak, but he was spiritually strong on that mountain. But in the garden, Adam was physically strong, but he was spiritually weak. You see the revelation of that difference? See, Jesus was hungry, but Adam was greedy. He was physically weak, but he was... Fi see, here's what Adam didn't understand. Jesus was physically weak and weary, but that's the lamb. But he was spiritually strong, and that's the lion. See, he come messing with you. He don't know what he going to get. Is this the lamb or is the lion? Well, come on and see. Come on and find out which one is going to be. Pull up. So that's why fasting must include food because there is a, there is a, a component physically and Satan knows that we have to eat. 
After Jesus had his encounter with the woman at the well, all day long, back and forth to her about water, about husbands, about mountains, about worship, the disciples came to Jesus and said, all right, now Jesus, it's time for you to eat. And Jesus said, oh, I have meat that you don't know of. The disciple said, did I miss something? Did one of y'all give the master something to eat? Jesus said, don't worry about it. My meat is to do the will of the father who sent me. You go ahead on and eat your Twinkies and your Capri Sun. You need a snack. You ain't done nothing. I'm the one that ministered to the woman at the well. You stood there trying to figure out what was going on and what's going on with her husband. See, you standing there judging. I did all the work. Go ahead on and get your snack. But my meat is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. There's a meal that I can get that you don't understand yet. This same Jesus, the way he whipped Satan, he said, listen now, um, I know you coming to me while I'm hungry and you bringing up bread. See, when you on a fast, you got to be careful when somebody bringing up something to eat all the time. That's why you got to separate yourself. You know we fasting, we work in the same office, and here you come as Zaxby's. I'm not mad at you if you're not going to observe the fast, and can you at least help me get through it? Y'all better find some people to be around. It's not going to be easy if you don't separate yourself. Jesus told Adam, um, told Satan, uh, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of mouth of God. Do you know that you can live off the word? Did you know that you can live off the word? Get yourself in that word and you'll forget you haven't eaten today. Y'all ain't want to talk. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. God is exalted. And listen, even when we are depleted, we will never be defeated. Even when you're depleted, you will never be defeated. But we must be obedient. So let's look at it, church. I'm ready to get into this fast because it draws us closer to God. Because we separate ourselves from the world that we are in and we close the gap in the world that we of. Jesus taught the disciples to pray because they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And if you look at the account in Matthew chapter 6, as soon as he, he taught them to pray, he said, and this is how you fast. He put them together. Look at Matthew 6, verse 16. I'm going to keep going quickly. It says, this is Jesus talking. Moreover, when you fast, now he's talking about what not to do. Take note. Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. It won't be what they're looking for. Verse 17, but thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. Fix yourself up. Because some people, when they don't eat, they, feel, they really get sick. They start feeling real bad and sorry for themselves. They don't pick up their feet when they walk. They don't get dressed. They just got on a robe. And I think they get a temperature and they just sort of kind of like this. And if some people go out just like that, I'm fasting. Y'all pray for my strength. I'm fasting. You know we got to fast at the church. I'm f Jesus said, don't do that. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. So church, I'm done teaching. I hope you know what you need to know about the fast. Because we're going to go into some instructions. The spirit and the soul. We, we gave you this whole presentation during the Marismos. Say spirit, spirit. Soul. soul. They both have an insatiable desire. Oh, your spirit wants God. It does. And your soul wants everything else not like God. So the focus during the fast, watch this, is to feed one and starve the other. Feed the spirit and starve the soul. You've got to understand that this is about your time, your treasure, and your attention. So here's the goal. Y'all ready for the goal of the fast? And, and whatever information is up on the screen will also be available at the Welcome Center when you leave. I didn't want to uh, pass it out and, and get all in my feelings because you say I don't need one. It's not about me. 
So it's at the Welcome Center, and we don't have cameras. So just grab one on your way out if you desire to participate in the fast. This is a willing, temporary abstaining of natural habits and pleasures for a spiritual outcome and result. Amen? Amen. So here's the goal. Knowing, say knowing. knowing. Knowing what consumes the majority of your time. Say your time. Your attention, your energy, give as much of yourself to God daily. That is the general goal for our fast. Knowing what consumes your time, energy, effort daily. So that means I can't, listen, so uh, I'm going to use this term. I'm giving you information that's called a a description, not a prescription. There's a revelation of a difference. The doctor says, here's your prescription for the medicine. Take two by mouth with food four times a day. That's a prescription. Uh, The doctor doesn't say, well, here's the medicine. Just sort of kind of do what you need as needed. Right? So what I'm giving you is not a prescribed fast. It is a described fast. I'm describing it. You know you. I don't have the authority to stand above you and tell you no social media. I can't do that. I might need to do that for myself. I think I do. Amen? But I can't prescribe it for you, so here we go. Knowing what you know about yourself, use this as a guideline. Let's look at our base scripture, and everybody got to capture this. Base scripture in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. He says, then I proclaimed the fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might, have we heard this before, afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones, even for your children, you fast for them. And for all our substance, that's our base scripture for the fast. So here are the instructions. Number one, separate and consecrate yourself from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, that's not bad. No food. Only water, herbal teas, and non-sugary drinks from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Look at your neighbor and say, that's not bad. bad. All right, so when we say no food, only water, herbal teas, and non-sugary drinks, please understand that the caveat is if you are under doctor's orders, please adhere as best you can to your doctor's orders. Eating, taking medicine, whatever you are do, just do what the doctor said do. God knows. Amen? Can we do that? Okay, prayer, a minimum of three times a day. To some people, this is not a problem. To others, they just don't do it. So we want to just, we want to make some improvement in this area. Prayer, three times a day. So here's what we want to try to do. Pray sometime in the morning. Say amen. Amen. Personally, pray again in the evening. But this time, gather your family. Get your wife, get your husband, get your kids. Let's just lock in for the evening. Amen? And then in the middle of the day, if you are able to around noon, everyone who works different schedules and has different things to do, try to stop what you're doing. I want us all to lock in and pray. It won't be a conference call. It won't be virtually. No no computer streaming or, or conference call. Just God knows that the people that assemble here have stopped what they were doing and said a word of prayer. Church, prayer is important. I promise you God has directed us in what it is that I believe we should do. And I think I'm hearing from here clearly. And I'm putting it out this way so that you don't have to come back to me about exceptions and what ifs. Just do the best. Do the best you can. Amen. Finally, you know we already have intercessory prayer. Join us 7 p.m. September the 9th, 26th, um, 9th, 23rd, and 26th. I think those are Friday, Friday, Friday. 9th, 16th, and 23rd. Thank you for helping me. I'm so glad I got a wife that helps. Sort of like the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. The Holy Ghost is your helper. The Bible says when you find a wife, I mean, the Bible says God gave Adam a helper. So the Holy Ghost, your wife, come on, they about the same. September 9th, 16th, 23rd, 7 p.m. Join us for intercessory prayer. We're going to have some special topics to go through the fast. You guys got these instructions. I can't see what's on the screen, but y'all tracking? 
You track it? So let me just give you this recommended prayer. Let's just say this together. This is right where you are. Say, Lord, Lord I, decrease, I decrease so you can increase in me. During this time of fasting, I empty myself of myself so you can fill me with your spirit, strength, and power. I look away from and close my ears to distractions so I can focus on you. Help me to use this time for growth, renewal, revelation, and healing. Come on, who means this? Who means this? Calm my anxiety about what I might be giving up or times of discomfort that I might face. In Jesus' name, amen. So church, the desired outcome or results, we're going to go right back to Ezra chapter 8. Verse 23 says, So we fasted and besought our God for this and was entreated, and he was entreated of us, which means he answered our prayer. You see what the base scripture is and you see what the desired outcome is. I don't mean to be professorial, but I need to make sure you understand that God has laid this thing out in his word. That's the outcome. What are we looking for? An afflicted and subdued soul under control. We're looking for physical health improvement. Watch this. This is so important. Physical health improvement from known or unknown ailments. Some people know they're sick. Some people don't. The doctor has told some people they're sick. Others have not had a wellness check and you're sick. We pray that during the fast, God heals you and you didn't even know you were sick. Is that all right? Number three, spiritual growth, breakthrough, and revelation. I know everybody don't necessarily want to grow. No indictment, no shame. There's a huge segment of Christendom that believe that you've given your life to the Lord. Amen. You're going to go to heaven when you die. That's wonderful. God bless you. But in order to be effective in the kingdom and make sure your kids go, make sure your cousin goes, make sure that you aren't the only person saved in your office. I mean, you really are okay with that. Things would be so much better at work if a couple more people got saved. So what you going to do about it? There's always so much contention in our meetings. Mm -hmm. You're the only one saved. What you gonna do about it? I'm gonna move on from that. Sharper spiritual senses, increased access to God, say closer to Him. A pure heart, clear heart, and mind. Let's give God praise for in advance for that outcome. That's what we want as an outcome. So let's talk practical and I'll get out of your way just some practical things the fast is an exchange it's an exchange so if you give up the hour you have for lunch because you don't want to eat you're not going to eat you don't then go run all your errands and pick up your laundry if the hour is given for lunch then you give it to God go sit in your car and read your word or go in the break room and listen to a podcast of your favorite preacher. I don't know who that might be. No, 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 no. Whoever is your favorite. Give that time to God. Let me give you another one. If you know every morning at 8.30 you're in the line at Starbucks to get that um, Venti. Is that the biggest one? There's one bigger than that. Mr. Shine, what is it? There's one bigger than that. <laughs> If you know that's where you are at 8.30 every morning, that's about $6, 5 or $6. This is not a fundraiser for Victory Church, but listen to me, listen to me. Since you're going to give it up, just take the $6 and bring it here. Give it to God. That's the exchange that we're talking about. If you, listen, it's not just bad things. If you work out every day, your day is consumed. Just take that one hour, two hour, if you can. Say, you know what, God? 
I'm doing a lot to get my physical being squared away, but I need to give this hour to you for my spiritual muscles. You can skip a couple of days at the gym. Y'all getting quiet on me. Whatever the routine is, whatever the routine is, the fast says, I want to interrupt the routine and give it to God. Some people only need four or five hours of sleep at night. I'm a former military guy. I don't know why my body still wakes up at five. I'm mad. So I'm rebelling. I'm just laying there. I'm not moving, but I'm awake. I don't know when, I don't know when it's going to end. Somebody's going to have to help me, but I want to sleep to 6.30 perhaps, like everybody else. But if you need seven, eight hours of sleep at night, that's not a problem. Sacrifice one of those hours and give it to God. You can get up in the middle of the night or you can just get up earlier. What God wants to see is that you are willing to interrupt your routine to give to him. It's an exchange. Minister Shania discovered Cindy Trim some years ago and, and presented to me this concept of commanding my morning at three because that's before the devil start working I'm like um since I already got to get the get up at six can we just no it's got to be three the thing I want you to know is you know you you know your routine you know your schedule so you decide what you want to give to God and it needs to hurt you. Somebody say amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Hey, thank you so much for watching this sermon. I really appreciate you being a part of our service on today. But listen, you don't have to stop there. Subscribe to this channel so you can know when we upload content or when we go live. Also, you can come and join us live at Victory Church at any time. Meet us at 11 a.m. right here at The V. And finally, please share this sermon with a friend. That way you help us spread the gospel to a dying world. Thanks again for watching and God bless you.